moves to the agenda, and um, we're going to have um, discussions about transparency um, and then about the events of the last week or so. Um, over the years, these meetings have changed in terms of how we go about discussions, um, but, the, but the practice we've had over the last several meetings has been that we will talk about it, we'll talk about it as a board and a GLC, and then each topic, and then we'll open it up for general discussion rather than having us talk about everything and then general discussion at the end. Um, we figured it, it made, made life easier to talk about things as they were coming through. Um, and so what I'd like to do is set up the discussion of the transparency policy. Um, transparency has been in our news in the last couple of weeks. Um, we received a letter from the uh, Attorney General's office uh, a week ago Friday um, that asked us to create a policy that would show her the transparency that exists um, and to have us think about it. Um, we welcomed that. Um, we asked the office if they could give us some transparency policies for charities for 501c3s um, like the Greenway. And they, um, when they looked, they found that although folks in Massachusetts had some very good practices, there was no transparency policy that they could find that had been voted by a board of a 501c3. Um, so we said we're happy to be the first, and um, that's what we've done. Um, we, this, this policy goes to who we are. It is not new practice for us. Um, it is all things that we have done with our various committees, our various conflict of interest, our various um, practices that have gotten us a seal of approval from GuideStar. GuideStar is a uh, um, is a charity navigator, I guess. It's, it's a charity navigator um, that is a watchdog group that um, looks at transparency, which, as you all probably know, is a big thing now in nonprofits. Um, that it's important to have transparency, and so because we do things like post our audited financials on our websites, post our 990 on our website post the minutes of all the public meetings, post the, um, if there's PowerPoints of the public meetings, post those, um, that we have a document section that is very robust. And what, because we have done that, we've gotten a very good rating. Um, we also are happy to have the, um, the policy uh, be endorsed by the board, and as all policies are, and so we're happy to do that. I want to point out that the 2008 statute that, um, that enabled the Greenway Conservancy um, said, and I quote, nothing in this act shall be construed as establishing the Conservancy as a governmental body. Um, I think that's key to our policies. Um, we are a 501c3. Um, like many 501c3s in the state, um, we receive funding from the, the state government. Um, there are well over 50 um, private, non not private, public nonprofits um, that receive public monies. Um, they are, range from things like major hospitals um, to the YMCA to groups that try to prevent and, and um, foster, prevent homelessness and foster um, self sufficiency. Um, there's a general recognition um, from the state that nonprofits can often do work better and more efficiently than a state government can. And that's the framework under which the Greenway Conservancy operates. Um, so this policy is one of transparency for us as we are currently um, legally constructed, which is a 501c3. Um, I'm now I'd like to open it up to um, discussion um, from the board and the GLC. And uh, I know you've all been thinking about it. Um, this, these drafts were um, worked on and worked on. We thank our attorneys for that. Um, and, and, and the staff and the board, who, the people who worked on it, and uh, would like to just open it up to discussion. Georgia, do you have more copies? Do you have more copies? I don't have a copy. Oh, I don't. But I thought you had, like, we, we apologize for the change in locations. Um, we were actually set up to be on the first floor, um, and there was a little bit of a scheduling issue. These were emailed to you, but it's not, not very long ago, so that's why you don't have it. Does anybody else? Oh, okay. Just How about other people? I'm 
sorry. I thought I thought people were saying to have it. Is, is this the same one that was sent this morning? Yes. No. Okay. So I was just going to mention, just with having reviewed this this morning, and I actually think, I mean, this policy is provides for actually more transparency than I think most 501 C3s um, undertake. So I, I think it reflects an enormous amount of transparency for a C3. So I frankly, I'm, I'm pleased with it. I, it, it. I also think it was really terrific that you reached outside our own discussion group and sought out um, some experts in the field to find out. Um, I did a little checking myself with some of the quasi-publics that I have past familiarity with, and um, none of them have their own written transparency policy, even though they try to follow transparency policies. It's not written, it's not codified, it's not posted on their websites, and I think this is a terrific step in the right direction uh, in terms of posting and having a transparency policy that people can read and see, and I think um, others may follow suit. We like to lead, so that's right. great. Um, I think it was helpful for me to see um, all those other documents kind of drafted in. Because certainly as part of the board member, you know, you read all the policies and all, but when they're read kind of one at a time, it feels a little disconnected. So the fact that they've now been pulled together and the fact that I, I'm not sure we didn't have to create anything. No, this, this is codifying what we so do. So I, I felt good about that, that this reflects what we've been doing, and it, but it puts it in a nice place where we can see it all together. Any other board or GLC comments before we open it up to general discussion? Yes. Uh, oh, come on up. <laughs> you no, know, no, that's quite all right. Um, um, I wonder if I could ask within the context of Secretary Davies' letter last week, uh, and one of the points that he raised relative to the Open Meetings Law and, and FOIA requests suggested that the Greenway uh, needed to uh, comply with those, uh, how this policy uh, interacts with that and, and whether or not uh, there's a position that has been taken by the board relative to that request. Um, we have not had an opportunity to meet with Secretary Davey yet. Um, and so what we have, we have simply responded that we will always talk to everybody about anything, particularly Secretary Davey, um, and, um, and talk to him about what he's requested. We, he, has, he has asked that as a, as a um, prit -po, prit -po, bleh, as a condition for, uh, for the, the, uh, the extension of the lease, that perhaps we should fall into things that we don't fall into now. Um, that's very clear in his letter. He understands that we don't fall into those now. He wants us to fall into them in the future. Um, we will discuss that with him. Um, we, we are a 501c3, and this is um, excellent transparency for a 501c3. But that, so our position is, this is who we are, um, and these are the policies that we'll have for that. Um, and we look forward to a discussion with Secretary Davey about it. Anne. Yeah, I just, um, going back in history a little bit here, I was part of the audit committee in the GLC, remember me as the founding chair of the GLC. Um, when you look at, and what we did in 2009, just to expand on what, uh, what Georgia was saying, um, we were in a unique position because the IRS and Congress had just done a very extensive review and debate about what should be the transparency standards. More importantly, the governance standards for not-for-profit organizations. And so after years of looking at this, they came out with the new Form 990. And in 2009, to corroborate what Georgia has said about this isn't new, the Audit and Risk Committee, Bob Gore will remember, Chris Finchman will remember, we spent hours going through that Form 990 to make sure that the Conservancy complied with the letter and the intent of what the IRS was now requiring. And it was an extensive process. We brought in an expert on a pro bono basis to review what we were doing to make sure it complied. In addition, we went to the standards that the Better Business Bureau, Charity Navigator, and GuideStar have promulgated to see if we met the standards. And I was, I was new then to the Conservancy. I was so pleasantly surprised to corroborate what you said that we exceeded the standards of most nonprofits. I've worked with nonprofits all my life, and hundreds of those that receive state funding, and we clearly exceed. So I would really encourage, as this 
debate clearly will continue. There are some great things, not, you know, objective, the watchdogs that look at us, that have looked at salaries for nonprofits, governance for nonprofits, transparency for nonprofits. Go to the Charity Navigator website. It will be very enlightening to really inform this discussion as it goes forward. But I was pleasantly surprised in 2009 to know that I could hold my head high and say as a 501c3, the Conservancy really exceeded the standards and what I have seen many, many nonprofits do. So I just encourage us all to be balanced as we move forward. And thank you. And as a former senior partner of PricewaterhouseCoopers, with this part of your practice being front and central, and as a professor at the Kennedy School, we really do appreciate that. Thank you. Um, any, anyone else? Well, I, I just weigh in to echo what Anne has said, that it starts with a very simple concept, you know, and it's, it's very well intended. Uh, but the, sim the simplicity gradually is, is lost because you're dealing with complexity. As, you, as any of you who have dealt with Form 990s or any, or if we return to the for-profit sector where you have the compensation and discussion and analysis, the CDNA, it was intended not to be fancy, straightforward words. It now occupies more pages in a proxy than anything else. And it's, it is well intended. Here we have the same challenge. As you go through the 990s, to, it's, it's hard work because you have to keep your eye on the balls of what you really want to do, which is communi communicate with your constituencies on a fair and accurate basis. But uh, boy, it's a lot of work. Um, and I, you know, thank goodness to Ann uh, for, she uh, was doing a lot of the heavy lifting. And Georgia, really to echo another point that Ann made, um, I think the, the transparency policy is one critical element of an overarching set of governance policies. And from our committee structure to our code of ethics to our corporate governance guidelines that we use as uh, the parameters to check what we're doing to um, our whistleblower policy, um, uh, code of conduct, both internally and externally. Not only do we publish all of these things um, and keep this available to the public, but internally we all live, including the board of directors, by a very strict set of strictures that um, help us, we hope, continue to be um, meeting the high bar, not a baseline standard. It, and the other, other thing I would just add uh, is that this is certainly, like many things, uh, an ongoing process of continuous improvement. You discover things that you look at, at, your, at your website or your 990 and say, gee whiz, we could do a better job on this. And uh, so it's, it's not a static uh, process. I think that's true, and I think that that's, um, that gives me the opportunity to say that one, one of the things we're, we're doing with this is to, we, we've had practice before transparency, but to really say we're endorsing a total culture of transparency at the Greenway, um, from the staff to the board um, to everyone whom we work with, that um, we know that th this is our practice, but we also know that sort of the, we want the first um, reaction to be how can we get you information, not what do we have the right to withhold? And so that that is the framework of what this, this policy is saying. And we endorse that, I'm hoping, as a board. And But we also recognize that transparency does not equal consensus. It does not mean that even though we're transparent about our information and the decisions of the board, that everyone will agree with everything we do. Um, it's just not going to happen. Good people, whether you're on the board or not, um, can have different opinions about what should be done with the same same information that's given you. We will we will make those decisions as a board. We will try very hard to get it right. Um, we won't always make the exact right decision every time, but we sure will try. And so, um, I just did want to put that out there that um, we will be transparent. We may not always agree um, with everything. Yes, Matt. Hi. Stuff here. You know, <laughs> Get front and center. I, I treat myself the same way, actually. You. <laughs> First of all, I thank the Conservancy for allowing me one of the things to videotape uh, the, the meetings as I've done in the past. I, I just have to do say, though, that I, I find the, the transparency policy quite disappointing. I mean, the question really that was going to be watched at this meeting is whether the Conservancy is going to evolve at all in terms of transparency. And without any reference to the Freedom of Information Act or the Open Meeting Law, um, or any efforts to really move in that in that direction, I think that uh, that's a community member and someone who reports on the community 
I think that's, uh, that's disappointing. That, that's your right to be disappointed, and I'm sorry for it. But um, our, our position is, is that we're a 501c3. And as a 501c3, we are not subject to FOIA and public meeting law. And so therefore, this is a codification of where we are today. Anyone else? Okay, um, may I have... Oh, I'm sorry, Bob. Um, what is the, in practical terms, what is the argument against adopting those as voluntarily, uh, not as part of a required agreement with DOT or anything else, but uh, voluntarily as a board to say that you choose to be subject to FOIA and open meeting laws? Let's, good question. Um, let me maybe give you a for example because it, it gets very <coughs> theoretical, you know, when you, when you talk about public meeting law. I mean, obviously we have public meetings all the time, so what's the problem, Georgia? Why, why, why aren't we doing this? Um, the, the issue is, is that as a, as a nonprofit, we rely on our board for strategy and for discussion about where we're moving forward. We're not a public agency where the board is, are the people who simply, not simply, but very difficultly sometimes, um, decide on contracts or decide on, on different expenditures of funds. We, we really do um, think through how the conservancy should go forward. We also think through how we um, ask people to give to us philanthropically, and that's often very private information. Um, you know, uh, many of our donors want to remain anonymous, and so that, that's part of the reason why there are different rules for 501c3s. And Anne looks like she wants to speak to that. Yeah, I think, Bob, your question is a, is a really good one, and it really goes back to Congress. And they debated that very point very explicitly when they developed the Form 990 for charitable organizations. And they consciously said, for example, that in terms of salary information to avoid voyeurism and other things that people love, there are levels that should be disclosed, and they are disclosed much more completely than anywhere else. They disclose fringe benefits. They went through excruciating detail. The other point that, that Georgia just made is really important. The IRS specifically, despite all this expanded information we now give them in the Form 990, including disclosures on how salaries are set, including disclosures on our board members, whether we have an audit committee, they specifically said you do not have to provide under FOIA or anything else information around your donors. Donors have the right to privacy. And when I looked at the public records law, it was explicit. Only applies to governmental entities. And the kinds of exemptions that are in the public records law really don't relate to us. They contain nothing on donations and the other attributes. So the important, and there's a context here, and then George, I have to sit down and shut up. There's a, there's a very important context here. The IRS establishes 501c3s. And in every state, the state attorney general is the responsible party for the oversight. And that is delegated to the board of directors, who are the fiduciaries for the general public. That's in contrast to the governmental form of organization. So hopefully that helps. And I get too dogmatic when I start talking like this, but I, I can tell I feel very passionately about it. So George, I just want to cover for me. No, no, no. <laughs> Love working with you. Sorry, you're not still on the board. Um, the um, so so Bob, that's part of it. You know, the fact that we have to raise money. I mean, our our mission is to raise money philanthropically and other ways. The other part of it, though, is strategy. That you know, the um, we have basically think of it as unpaid um, people who give them who volunteer their time to help um, create the vision and move forward. And that requires people to what I call think out loud. You know, to be able to say, you know, to have meetings and be able to say, here's where we think we should be going. You know, and then be able to say, ah, you're right, we shouldn't be going that way. You know, so. It, it gets it so that people can have really free and frank discussions. And, um, and although we certainly don't say anything we don't believe in public meetings, it isn't that same level of candor that you can have in terms of, can I think this through with you? Can I, can I play devil's advocate? Can I do that? It doesn't lend itself to public meeting law. Um, do you want more examples? You don't look convinced. I can give an example. Sure, I'd like to give an example for some, some context because I mean the key point is that you know this is public land. Certainly understand the conservancy is a private 501c3. Uh, but last year, for example, I asked some questions about the legislation meeting uh, and some transparency and some light items in the financials. 
I was told that you know it would be coming uh, and that, that I would get it. The next meeting, there was no Q&A, and the meeting was shut down before the public had a chance to talk. I uh, spoke to the executive director after the meeting, who said, well, email it to me. I did email my questions, and it was no response. And so that this is the example of where you know the responsibilities of conservancy, I think, fall down, and without a policy in place to respond to what is actually going on on these public parks, um, I think it's a, it's a serious shortcoming. Okay, Matt. I, I since I run these meetings, I apologize if I shut them down without Q and A. I, I honestly don't remember doing that, but if I did, I this apologize. Was me. Oh, okay. Um, so. If, um, and if we haven't given you the information, I will, and it is information that we can give you. So it's not who gave us money under what. I mean, if it's information we can give you, you will have that information um, of whatever you want. I guarantee it. Um, and I'm sorry that you didn't have it in the past. Um, yes. Um, I'm Diane Valley, and one of the problems I have is in review of the financial statements, I find it difficult to understand what is in the financial statements because they're bundled. And so, for instance, you have public relations people that are paid and um, columnists that are paid, and it's, I think, under community outreach. And that's difficult for the public to understand what is what the conservancy is actually spending the money on. So maybe if you could disclose the expenses with full disclosure and transparency, maybe we would not have this discussion. Okay. Um, first of all, I don't know of any columnists that, that we pay. <laughs> <laughs> we probably could use some that we pay, but I don't think we have them. Um, the, um, the, the public relations people fall, fell into two categories. One was um, the person who gets us tries to get us good press, whether it's for food trucks or for um, things happening on the Greenway, to get it out there, the public will know, the public will support it. The other, in the last year, has been the folks who've helped us with the bid strategy and to do the campaign to try to get the butters to pay into a bid. Um, we have, I mean, I didn't know we were asked the question before, but I do know that we disclosed that with, with the information that we gave out last week. Um, so once again, when you have financial statements, we have the audit, we have everything. If you want, and I do apologize if we're not getting this, we will get to people with some information that we can get you if you have questions on it. Um, not very many nonprofits, I actually couldn't find any, and I Googled around a lot this weekend, um, give the last three years' worth of audits. Um, most will give one year of audit. Some will give the 990. But we have given you a trail of audits and 990s on our website. And we disclose more on our website um, than certainly we did before. Those were all on our website before. Um, and they are continuing. And we've loaded up our policies so that you can see them. We thought if we were going to endorse this with the transparency policy, we would um, also let you be able to see what the code of ethics policy is, whatever. That's all on our website. But however, this is where it's difficult for us because when um, Marianne Thompson, who's a very well-known architect, was engaged by the Conservancy to build a build, design a building on this public land without any public process, many of us asked for that information and it was denied. And I can't find it in your financial statements. However, she was engaged. So. If there's not disclosure on that and there's not detail, how uh, how are we as the public to understand where the money goes? Dan, I've been on the board for three years, so that was before I was even on the board, let alone board chair. So I don't know that specific. Um, I am telling you going forward, um, if you want that information, we will get it to you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Vivian Lee. I'm president of the Boston Harbor Association, which is another not-for-profit. I think this is a very good start towards transparency. And I will tell you that it has a ripple effect throughout the not-for-profit community. Uh, I was at two meetings last week, including at Mass Development, which is a, a state agency. And the discussions that we had, and we operate like you under the uh, Open Sunshine Meetings Act, uh, significantly influence what we were doing. So I commend you because, frankly, all of us are now much more vigilant in terms of being even more open than we've <coughs> ever been, being sure that the public is engaged, that people have sufficient notice and such. 
as you stated, this is a policy going forward. So whatever may have happened in the past, we collectively in the not-for-profit community are learning. Uh, you know, you had much more complicated issues than, than the groups like us on the waterfront with the Occupy Boston deliberations, and I know there were discussions for public security reasons and others, which clearly could not be aired in a public forum. Um, I think the fact that your documents are on the website is absolutely crucial. I think that in terms of outreach to a broader audience, we would hope that you also reach out not only to the traditional business community and those immediately around you, but that the mailing list and the email list is made even more robust, and potentially in other languages as well. We are sitting in Chinatown, you know, which is a very much a part of the Greenway as well. And so to be sure that you reach out to some of the organizations and neighborhood-based organizations that Helen and others are involved with, I think, is really crucial. You're also very close to South Station, which is on the Red Line, which is close to Dorchester and other neighborhoods that frankly do enjoy the Greenway and the waterfront. And again, large Spanish-speaking populations in those neighborhoods as well. And that we hope that you will make your mailing list and your email list even more robust perhaps even translating things in another language or having it so that people who speak another primary language uh, can have access to it. Um, with regards to the documents, I think that the types of documents that you have, is, as required under the Attorney General, are things that I think will be very useful for all of us in the community trying to move forward in terms of being sure that the type of programming and the expenditure of funds are done in a way that everyone understands. Our organization and many not-for-profits receive both federal and state, agents, uh, state funds as well. And all of us have to follow the reporting requirements of, say, EPA, Region 1, or if we get state dollars, or in our case also city dollars, such as the VRA, and uh, we get money from the MWRA and such, so that all of us, uh, like you, have to follow fairly strict reporting requirements. And I think that is embodied in what you're talking about. But as Diane and Matt and others have said, I think some of the line items sometimes when we have to combine things, and for us in our audit, they combine things like Diane was saying. You know, the auditor says combine these. It may not be self-evident to the public as they read it. So audit documents are very different than what is of interest to all of us collectively in this room. And you may want to have another document that explains in greater detail what the audit document uh, requires. So our auditor very often will bundle, as Diane says, very line, various line items, because from an accounting point of view, that is all that's required. But I think for greater understanding of the process, it may be useful to have a <coughs> supplementary document, which is not required in an audit, but would help to enlighten some of the dialogue that Matt and Diane and, and you know, um, Bob and Vivian, others thank indicated. you. We, we actually report to the states quarterly um, and with great detail on how their money is being spent. Um, we also, when we hired Jesse Brackenberry, which, two years ago? That would, um, one of the first questions we asked him um, was, can you make our numbers look easier to read um, from a board perspective um, a as well as a public perspective. And so for those of you who've been in public meetings for all these many years, I think you've seen a real difference in our clarity and in the sort of readability of uh, our financial statements. We always had it right in terms of our financial statements, but putting it in context that you could really understand. Um, we are really open to questions. We're never going to be able to get a statement on our website that answers every single question. Diane's going to be interested in something. You're going to be interested in something else. Matt's going to be interested in another thing. Um, but we are open to talking to people. Um, I mean, we we spent hours um, with the Herald Reporter uh, uh, two weeks ago, not just giving her the financial statements, which could have been on the website, but explaining the financial statements. And so we will we will be open to doing that. Um, you know, we we want to be transparent. We we. We will be as transparent as we possibly can be, and we will have a culture of transparency. And I think it's pretty clear in the document, as I said, and so we are supportive in that sense. I think the comments that we're making are to make it an even more robust discussion. I think, as we have collectively said, we are very supportive of the efforts that you were talking about. And I think, as I've said, again, just and I'll sit down at that point, it has had an impact in the whole not-for-profit community, which I think is a good thing. I do, too. And I, and I, I take your language um, suggestion, and I think it's an excellent one. 
And so um, we will, you know, so many people want to volunteer for the Greenway, which is wonderful. And I'm sure we can find uh, a China, someone in the Chinatown community and someone in the <coughs> Dorchester Roxbury community who will translate these for us. Um, and I think that's a fabulous idea. And George, just <coughs> one final comment. I, I think those comments about continuous improvement. We just had three great examples of things after that point. But I'd like to step back and, and say, well, why are we doing all this? And the reason you're doing all this is not to create paper, which is, of course, a byproduct or electrons now for an electronic age, uh, but to give the public and other uh, uh, organizations information to evaluate how funds are being spent, how services are being delivered. And I've been in business for 40 years, and I look back at some of the disclosure practices and the actual practices going back in time in the not-for-profit sector, and abuse was, was, was all too common. It's, it's no accident that we've got you know, IRS rules or regulations coming here to, to look at this. And so from a practical perspective, as you look at what disclosure is intended to do to give people in the public, other professionals, an ability to have a window into an organization, say, how are those dollars being spent? Are the services being appropriately delivered in an efficient manner? And you, then you look at the uh, emergence of organizations that have taken up the banner very seriously. Uh, Charity Navigator is <coughs> one, and GuideStar. And it's, and it's not unimportant to have a GuideStar rating for outstanding uh, disclosure. And if you read their surveys, if you read their analyses about how they evaluate organizations <coughs> in terms of efficiency as to whether your dollars should be going there, because that's really what it's all about. Do we want to invest in this organization or not? It's really a different world than it was 30 years ago. And I think probably five years from now, it's going to be even better. So, but thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else? on? Um, GLC board, general public. I guess I'd say I, mean, I I took a quick look at this this morning, and I, I think the transparency policy is definitely a, a great step in the right direction. The one thing that I keep thinking about personally is that um, <coughs> this policy is not being created in a vacuum, as far as just a regular 501c3. We are a bit unique as far as how we've been established, what the history is, and the fact that we're on public parcels, and that we're in some ways a creature of uh, legislation that came out um, in 2008. And so um, just seeing that there's pending legislation on the Hill, seeing that there's you know this letter that came in from Secretary Davey, uh, you know, requesting from the Attorney General as well, too, I think this is a great start. I wonder whether or not it's enough, given all of this sort of um, uh, uh, interest that's come into the, the board of the, and the, uh, the leadership council. So I don't have an answer on that, but I know that it's, it is a fact that we are not making this decision in a vacuum and that there are other sort of consequences here as well, too, that we need to be cognizant of. Um, so I just sort of wonder, again, what the sort of thinking is on that, given that reality. So. I, I think as um, a board, we're taking the position that we are a 501c3. Um, it says right in the enabling legislation that in no way do we be construed as a public agency. And so we are saying we want to be an excellent 501c3. Um, the future discussions with Secretary Davey uh, will be just that, future discussions. And um, how, how the Greenway is operated in the future, I, I can't speculate. Um, but we, we as a board have endorsed that we want to be the very best at transparency at 501c3. And we look forward to discussions with Secretary Davey about the future. Um, anyone else? Okay. Um, just, just one last comment. Chris, your comments are exactly spot on. I would encourage everybody to look at the state parks, look at state friends organizations, and all sorts of governmental organizations <coughs> as well, and just see the comparisons, because we did do that. We did look more broadly, just beyond 501c3s. And I was really encouraged to say, you know, I think the Greenway has picked the best of all wor worlds. And so I would encourage everybody today to go and look at some of the state agencies, some of the authorities, and just see if, how we compare in terms of real available transparent information. Um, it's, it's a good exercise for this discussion. Okay, we've had a motion proposed and seconded. Um, if there's no further discussion, could I have a vote of the board, please? To adopt the trans, what we're voting to is adopt the transparency policy that's before you. I didn't have a second? I don't know. Oh, second. Okay. 
Um, sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself here. Um, if, uh, if, I, if we could have a vote then, all in favor? Aye. 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 